Chatterjee is the professor of English, University of Poland, West Bengal. He has co-edited The Muffled Heart, Stories of the Disempowered Men and Nari Bhav, Androgyny and Female Impersonation in India. He is also the author of a novel called The Scholar. Since March 2020, he has also started posting videos on his YouTube channel. His areas of interest include masculinity studies and queer studies. Since 2010, he has been running a Facebook group called New Gender Studies. With this brief introduction, uh, I, uh, I welcome Professor Niladri Chatterjee to address our participants. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think we've just started um, going live on YouTube as well. Um, excuse me, excuse me, just one moment, just one moment. Okay, so yes, hello. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very grateful to Diamond Harbor Women's University for this opportunity. I would have to mention that I have visited your campus once. Uh, this was some years ago. And um, so I have been to your campus. I, at that occasion, I had met the students from the English department and it was a very nice experience. And, um, and now here I am meeting you, um, you know, having this interaction with you again, albeit uh, virtually. So, um, so Troy, how much time uh, do I have? Sir, please go ahead. I mean, it's, it's up to you entirely. We don't have that uh, time constraint. Uh, so no, no, but, but the students must have a, a, an attention span beyond which they yes. can't take in stuff. So. Yes. So how so long do you think I think, I should speak? I think it's a 45 minute, it can be a 45 minute lecture, Fact. followed by a 15 minutes is fine. Yes, yes, okay. That's absolutely perfect. That's okay. very good. Okay. Um, right, so no, I think 45 minutes is absolutely fine. So I'm going to stop at some time around um, sort of 4, yeah, 4, 4, 45, I think that should be okay. Now, um, I have been asked to talk about gender studies and, uh, and what I really wish to do is to basically, before I begin, I think it is very important for me to try and understand exactly where you are all coming from or what, what you would expect. Um, so this is something that is specifically um, addressed to the, the students who are, who are doing this coursework. Um, so could each of you tell me, um, you know, what, what is it that you expect from this talk so that, so that I could sort of position my, my talk accordingly? So is is Dishari uh, one of the students? No, she's no, our faculty. Uh, uh, oh, okay, okay. She's is our faculty. Deepa one of the students? Who's a, who's a student here? Uh, uh, um, of the apart from Monita, me, Deepa, and Dishari, okay. I think Golapsha is one of the scholars. Golapsha, Golapsha, and Laboni. They are the three scholars. Please respond to Professor Chatterjee, Golapsha, yeah, so, or Laboni. Yeah, so, Gulapsha, Laboni, and who else is there? Deepthi. Deepthi. Okay. Gulapsha, Laboni, and Deepthi. Okay. Um, so, so any one of you can start by telling me what is it that you expect from this talk? respond can you hear us no ma'am you cannot hear us what is your expectation from this lecture um, sir uh, please uh, 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 so please uh, share sharing you can communicate in whichever language you want to. There is no problem. So if you're comfortable, if, 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 yeah, so if you're comfortable in Bangla, you can certainly yes. speak in Bangla. That is not Absolutely, a problem. That's not okay. a problem. Sir, I think after research experience, I want to share coding. It's mostly very important. Okay, research experience, ACTA. Um, so uh, what, what would... Uh, I'm forgetting who who else uh, is a student Gulapsha. over here. Gulapsha, Gulapsha. Tumi, what 
what is your expectation what is it that you hope to gain from this uh, talk and also if gulabsha is not willing to speak if the third student can say something okay um so uh, so three may i ask you then uh, that um, the, exactly what what has already been taught to them as as far as um, gender studies is concerned or um, sort of queer theory what what has already been covered in class yes. so that okay, i don't okay. want to repeat stuff that has already been yes, done yes definitely yeah. I I have a very honest and clear cut confession that since oh. I uh, requested you to deliver a lecture therefore I <laughs> haven't even touched queer studies because I wanted my students to listen to your lecture first and then we should proceed so this is okay. the very clear cut and honest confession right ah, okay. so I yes yes that is something I wanted to do that they should uh, listen to your lecture first and then we will uh, teach them about the other things i mean all the specificities right and apart from mm. that in our class we mm. have already taught them like uh, feminist environmentalism to some extent and since mm. students are coming from different backgrounds so we have uh, maybe it's repetitive because students are also from women studies uh, mm. they have done mphil in women studies in spite of that right. we we have taught them like different schools of feminist thought and then waves of feminism so these things yeah. are always there and the two movements so all the uh, ideas are quite connected to each other and how women are related to law women are related to literature history yeah. so from diversified yeah. aspects we have tried to uh, it's not convincing them but rather we have tried to make them think that in whichever yeah. way they should think of women studies as well as gender studies and what is the importance as well as the relevance of the course work which they should pursue mm -hmm. and uh, again I, i i think that i i wanted to take this opportunity so that they would listen to your lecture first regarding queer studies so that is all oh, okay no that that i be okay so that definitely gives me a very clear idea uh, thank you throy uh, so that gives me an idea as to exactly where i where i should begin so um as as you have already mentioned that you have uh, covered the various waves of of feminism so can i just sort of begin from the second wave well actually let me just do a very quick uh, recap uh, of of the waves of feminism and then we can move on from there um every time i talk about or even i think about uh, the various waves of feminism what i invariably end up concluding is that these waves are primarily about uh, or the first two waves the first two waves were primarily about space they were primarily about space um the third one is also about space but uh, space in a slightly different um manner but the first two were definitely about space so if i think about the first wave of feminism i'm just very quickly going to go through this if i think about the first wave of feminism then that is clearly the time when uh, women were um, aware of the fact that the public space what we normally understand as the public space um is by default the male space um so we call it the public space but it becomes the male space um and so the uh, the mobilization that was regarded among a uh, necessary among women is that you know the public space should also be made um, a gender neutral space as much as possible so therefore women should have equal access to the public space uh, and at that time uh, right to education right to vote etc etc so these are sort of public um, you know entitlements uh, that that uh, a woman uh, has every right to um uh, and that is something that should be guaranteed to them when we come to the second wave of feminism this is when things start to become really really complicated because so far women had been taught that the public space is the male space but the private space is the female space so therefore women were under the impression that that the private space was a safe space that is where they could be uh, as they wish to be that there should not be any problem oh dear and then they realize that what is actually happening is that the private space they begin to understand 
is also a male space. So it, it wasn't as though, you know, there was a wonderful separation of spaces. Men can have their space in public as long as women can have their spaces in private. No, no, no. It was all male space. It was all male space. So the private space was male, the, the public space was male, every space was male. And so women began to understand that even when they are at home, even when they are in, you know, in a marriage, hmm, and even if they are being extremely well looked after by, by their birth family, even then, they actually do not have all of the rights that, for example, men um, in, in the family do. So, so the focus very much became about how to understand the domestic space or the private space as being patriarchal too. And so therefore, you know, you have talk about sexual rights, you've got to talk about reproductive rights, and, you know, a woman has a right to her own body, she gets to decide when the, when the, whether there should be an abortion or not, whether she wishes to conceive or not. And... And what also began to happen is that, you know, there, there emerged some kind of a, a, a bifurcation over here because there were some women who were beginning to talk about sex positivity. So there were some women who were saying, you know, and what about sexual pleasure? People just don't talk about sexual pleasure. We talk about, you know, the, the only way in which sex or the act of sex is talked about is when it is regarded as a, as a, as a legal problem as a criminal law problem. So therefore, the only way in which the public is um, agreeable to listen to any discussion about sex is when it is presented as a problem. If it is a problem, we listen to it. But, um, but if sex is presented as pleasure, then suddenly it becomes very difficult for the public to listen to it. So, oh, no, 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 this is something that we really don't want to engage with. So then there were some feminists who said, yes, this is something that we are not going to talk about. Let's not talk about sex as pleasure. Let's not talk about pornography. Let's not talk about any of this. And then there were these other feminists who were saying, who called themselves the sex positive feminists, who were basically saying, no, 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 we, we, we can't ignore this. We have to talk about women's pleasure. And this pretty much was the, I mean, there were other divisions as well. Remember, this is a time when also, um, you have um, uh, some feminists who are beginning to regard uh, Western feminism as overwhelmingly white and middle class. You know this. Uh, and so therefore, there were some who believed that uh, feminism needs to become a little bit more culturally diverse. It needs to become a bit more racially diverse. Uh, and all of this was going on. So in the midst of all of this, uh, what really happened, uh, you know, at the Stonewall Inn, for the Stonewall Inn, uh, you know, riots, uh, to assume this important place is very, very crucial for us to understand. What happened? What is the Stonewall riots? This is something that happened in uh, late June 1969 um, in New York. Uh, there is a bar called Stonewall Inn, uh, and that is where, you know, the, the gays and the lesbians and the trans, women, trans, men, they would congregate. Now, something that we really have to keep in mind is that these persons who congregated at the Stonewall Inn, uh, they came almost entirely, almost 100%, they all came from the working class, yes? So, therefore, the upper classes were not there. Uh, the middle class was not there. So if you could afford to have your own house, if you could afford to have a large house where you can have parties, then you could be gay or lesbian or trans in private, and that would be fine. But what about those people who did not have that private space? Where do they go to socialize? Where do they go to meet people of their kind? So for people like them, Stonewall Inn was a very important place at which to congregate. Now, Stonewall Inn also had a bit of a problem in the sense that it was, um, you know, it would be serving liquor, but it didn't have a liquor license. Um, and because it didn't have a liquor license, that usually gave um, the police uh, a free hand when it came to raiding Stonewall Inn. So raids would happen very, very often. Uh, and uh, and whenever a raid happened, you know, obviously people would, you know, run away. They would try to uh, look for other uh, 
ways of exiting the place and that is something that would happen. But something happened in, in that very hot night um, in, in late June 1969. Um, a raid happened. The police turned up. Um, as usual, they started arresting people. But this time, instead of running away, they fought back, which resulted in three nights of rioting. Yes, uh, broken glass on the street, uh, bricks uh, on the street, police getting, you know, a, a bloody nose, a black eye. So it got really, really nasty. But what it did was that after the three nights of rioting, there was a, some kind of a dawning of a realization within the, the gays and the lesbians and the trans persons who had been fighting for three nights uh, outside Stonewall Inn that we, we need to become a much more vocal political force. We need to become a much more vocal political force. And what happened was that those who do not identify as gay or lesbian or trans, uh, but who identify as you know heterosexual women, but who are feminists, there was um, a realization on their part as well that maybe we should um, make common cause with uh, these people because after all uh, they are fighting against the same thing that we are fighting against which is basically patriarchy so if they are fighting against patriarchy we are fighting against patriarchy let us all join forces and fight this together and as a result of which in 1970 you had the first um, pride march remember that when the first pride marches happened for a very long time, it was just gay and lesbian. It was just gay and lesbian. So, so the trans persons were there, uh, you know, the bisexual persons were there. But um, initially, when in the 1970s, some U.S. universities started to offer courses in gender studies uh, and in uh, sort of, you know, non-heterosexual gender studies, they would be calling their courses gay and lesbian studies, right? So therefore, trans and bi made a, a very late appearance uh, on onto the forum, as it were. So it took a, it took uh, you know it wasn't until sort of you know mid eighties, I think, uh, that that you know LGBT um, actually began to take shape. Initially, it was just LNG. And uh, so, which is why you have a very, very uh, well-established American magazine called uh, Gay and Lesbian Review. Um, so anyway, so that happened. And then as a result of which, um, a broader coalition was formed uh, to fight against, um, you know, what, what was regarded as patriarchy, yes, but also patriarchy that is regarded as being homophobic. So this aspect of patriarchy had not been acknowledged in then. Now there is the greater acknowledgement that patriarchy was not just misogynist, but patriarchy was homophobic as well. Okay. And then this continued for some time. Gradually, more and more people began to publish. Uh, you know, pride walks started to happen in more and more cities across the world. And, uh, and then in 1990, um, Judith Butler publishes her book, Gender Trouble. And the year after that, in 1991, you have Teresa De Laurentiis, who coins uh, the term queer theory. Well, I mean, she, she, what she does is she takes an old term. Queer, of course, was already a term that was available. Uh, but she takes that term, but she re-signifies it. She gives it a meaning that it didn't have till then. What is the meaning that, that she gives it? Well, she takes this term queer and then she goes to the root of the word queer. This is something that um, also is very, very beautifully explained by Eve Kosovsky Sedgwick uh, later. And so she, she, goes, she goes to the term queer, she goes to the root of the term queer, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it is derived from the German term, also pronounced queer or queer, and that is spelled Q U E R not the Q U W E R, um, And this term basically means a thwart. That is to say, at an angle. Yeah? So, a thwart. 
So when you are looking at something at an angle, what this basically means is that you are neither in total agreement with it, nor are you in total opposition to it. Yeah. So therefore, your engagement with a particular problem is angular rather than one of complete agreement, rather than one of total disagreement. So I think this is the, the it's this angularity of, of the queerness that I think we should keep in mind. If you think about queerness, think about primarily as a kind of angularity. You know, people have very often asked me, um, you know, Niladri Babu, jodi queer ke Banglai unubat kora jaya taale shita ki hobe. How would you translate queer into Bangla? And I have uh, thought about this long and hard. And I, the best that I could do was come up with Arotto. Arotto. So, I am going to do it. 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 I am going to do um, because patriarchy finds it very easy to neutralize any kind of opposition uh, that is uh, confrontational, openly confrontational, right? Shojashuji. Um, it becomes very easy for patriarchy to, to diffuse that kind of opposition. But patriarchy is going to be in, in a much, much more difficult situation if that opposition is not, you know, uh, absolutely direct. But if it is at an angle, if it is coming to patriarchy from an angle, then it becomes very difficult for patriarchy to um, neutralize it. And then, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you how this happens. So what we are really going to do, therefore, is look at the way in which patriarchy is going to be essentially confused. Confused. So a kind of confusion will be created in the mind of patriarchy. And, and through that confusion, patriarchy will be engaged with. So patriarchy will genuinely not know where the opposition is coming from. Queer. Queer, therefore, became uh, a kind of politics. And this is something which I would want to uh, make very, very clear because um, a lot of people still labor under the impression uh, that queer is a, is a, either a gender identity or a sexual identity. Please don't make that mistake. And, and I know that there are some, uh, I know that there are some very respected academics uh, who still believe that queer is primarily a sexual identity and it is primarily a gender identity. Um, I am not one of them. Uh, I believe that queer is not a gender identity. Queer is not a sexual identity. Queer is a politics. I think that is something that we have to keep in mind. Queer is a politics. It is a politics can be practiced by absolutely anybody, and it has got no relation whatsoever, no relation uh, with uh, who you are attracted to, what gender you claim for yourself. It has got nothing to do with that. It is a politics that has to be practiced. So just as you are not born a communist, you are not born a feminist. You are not born queer. Just as feminism is something that you learn, you look around you, you look at the society, you realize that there are certain things that are wrong in the society, you find out there are other people who have pointed out these wrongs, you identify with what they're saying, you gradually begin to understand that if I agree with these people, I can call myself a feminist. Similarly, if you've read Communist Party writings and if you read leftist literature and if you think that you can relate to what they're saying, if you find yourself in agreement, you can say, yes, I'm a leftist. Similarly, the practicing of queer politics is something that we all learn to do. We are not born queer. Um, you know, we become queer. Yeah? One is not born queer. Uh, one becomes one. Um, so what we are going to do then is to try and understand exactly how queer engages with patriarchy. Now, what I have told you is that queer is uh, queer engages with patriarchy at an angle. So queer is always going to confuse patriarchy because patriarchy will never be entirely sure as to 
from which angle it is being attacked. Something that I have not talked about so far is that just when queer is beginning to take shape, something else that is happening, and I think which is part of a larger movement, is that, um, you know, uh, postmodernism has already reached uh, its its apogee, right? So postmodernism basically starts, as you know very well, it starts from the late 1950s, um, and it gradually gathers strength all through 1960s and 70s and 80s. So by the time we come to the 1990s, postmodernism has become a very established aesthetic. It has also become a very aesthetic, uh, very established politics as well. And what we really have to understand then is that this is also a part of a bigger movement uh, and this is of course um, it's, it's probably not a movement uh, but um, a bigger philosophy hmm? uh, a bigger cultural turn um, which is deconstruction which is post-structuralism now what does deconstruction or post-structuralism do very simply speaking what deconstruction or post-structuralism does is that it makes you question the stability and the unity of meaning. That is broadly what it is, right? So therefore, what deconstruction or post-structuralism does is that it basically makes you question the um, supposed stability. Um, I think there is somebody here uh, who uh, has left uh, the microphone switched on. So, so if if they could kindly mute themselves, that would be very useful. Uh, uh, if somebody could kindly mute their microphone, I think that would be a good idea. Well, Mita, I think it's uh, Women's Studies DHW YouTube channel, I think. It's, yeah. Uh, so, uh, please yeah. mute it, Omita. Yes. Uh, Can you hear me, Romita? Right. Okay, I'm trying. Okay, okay. Uh, right. Um, so what's really happening then is uh, how, how does this function? How does the queerness function? But it functions, as I said, because it is part of a bigger um, kind of turn that happens in culture, in theory, which is deconstruction post-structuralism, which is basically about how meaning is unstable. Now, that is something that we should keep in mind because this is very, very crucial to the way in which we attack patriarchy because um, if, if your definition of patriarchy is that patriarchy is basically, uh, you know, uh, the men, bad women, sad, is that all women are beaten up and all men are doing the beating up. That is perhaps a very simplistic way of understanding patriarchy because what it really is, is that patriarchy is something much, much more um, insidious and much more toxic, much more poisonous uh, than simply, you know, acts of physical violence, which of course are horrible in themselves and totally to be condemned. But what is really happening in, in patriarchy is that there is a, a, a sense that meaning is going to be stabilized. And the, the one meaning that patriarchy is more invested in than in any other kind of meaning is, of course, gender uh, and then sexuality. Patriarchy is very invested in that. So therefore, what is really going on is, um, and these meanings are not going to be the meanings that you, you acquire later on in life. No, these meanings are actually dumped on you the moment you are born. You don't have a choice in, in how you are signified. You are signified uh, the moment you are born, and you don't have any say in the matter. Um, and then you are told to conform to the identity that you have been given. Remember the identity that you did not choose. You know, you did not, uh, you know, uh, emerge from your mother's womb and, uh, and decide that I'm going to be a woman or I'm going to be a man or I'm going to be a Hindu or I'll be an Indian. You didn't decide on any of this. These identities were dumped on you and then you are expected to conform to those identities, which is extraordinary. Um, so, so that is something which patriarchy is extremely invested in because the patriarchy is determined to ensure that those birth identities, those natal identities remain fixed. 
And here you have um, queer theory of deconstruction and post-structuralism, which is basically saying that meaning is unstable. So if meaning is unstable, then what is really happening is that you are then automatically going to start questioning the identities that have been dumped on you at birth. So you are going to start questioning not only gender, because gender has already been brought into question by second wave feminists, yeah? Sex is biological, gender is social, yeah? The second wave feminist mantra. But now, with the publication of Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, you are also beginning to question sex. So then you're beginning to uh, ask questions such as, when a baby is born, why is that baby a male child? Why is that baby a female child? What is it about that baby that automatically designates it as male or female? Now, the answer to that question seems very, very simple. Oh, you know, sir, if the male child has got a penis, then it is going to be male. If the, if, the, you know, if the child has got a vagina, then, should, then the child is going to be designated female. Surely, sir, there is nothing complicated there. Well, actually, there is something complicated there. In the sense that when a child is born, do you declare the child to be a doctor child or a lawyer child or a painter child? Do you? You don't. You say, oh, you know, uh, the child has been born. And we are simply going to see, you know, once the child comes to uh, consciousness and after the child has had the chance to look around and see what profession suits it best, you know, whatever profession uh, they want to, they, they, can, they can join. Um, so, miraculously, you give the child the freedom to choose the profession that they would wish to pursue later on in life. But these are the identities that you're not uh, allowing them uh, to, to choose from. Why is that? Why is it that the child has to conform to the identities that are dumped on the child at birth? So therefore, Judith Butler says that it is not as though sex is biological and gender is social. Sex is already social. So Judith Butler tells you that therefore, base on which gender is constructed is not a physical, anatomical, biological base at all. That base is a story. It's fiction. It's fiction. So you're going to say, but sir, what is so fictional about a penis? What is so fictional about a vagina? Well, let me tell you. Nothing fictional about the penis as such. We know what a penis is. It is a physical part of the human body. Nothing fictional. Nothing fictional about the vagina. We know what it is. What is fictional about it is that the penis is male and that the vagina is female. That is what is fictional. Why is that fictional? It is fictional in the sense that at some point, and this is where I think the transgender studies makes a very, very important contribution. At some point, if that child born with a penis, if that child decides that um, I, I don't feel like a man at all, I don't feel like a man at all, um, I feel like I would wish to um, wear a sari, I would wish to grow my hair long, I would wish to you know not have any facial hair, um, I would wish to be called by a female name, I would wish to present myself in a feminine way. And eventually, you know, this child is going to grow up and realize that, no, you know, I think I'm more identified. If that is what a woman is, if that is what people call a woman, I think I'm a woman. I think I'm a woman. So what uh, this person is going to do is they're going to start dressing up like a woman. They are going to perhaps undergo some kind of medical intervention. Uh, um, and it may not be a complete medical intervention. So, for example, they can have uh, silicone implants in their breasts, yes, so that their chest begins to look more feminine. Mind you that I'm using this within inverted commas. I don't know what a feminine chest looks like. There is a certain stereotype of a feminist chest. I don't know what a feminist chest is. There's a stereotype. But in real life, 
there are many, many kinds of women with many, many kinds of chest. So there is no one kind of feminine chest. Okay. But anyway, if, if this particular person wishes to um, adopt a certain kind of gender presentation that is most widely acceptable, no problem. But the person decides that I'm not going to go for gender corrective surgery as far as my genitals are concerned. So therefore, I'm going to retain my penis. I'm going to retain my, uh, my testicles. Um, and I'm going to keep them as it is. Okay. So if this person um, has absolutely transformed uh, herself into a woman, but has retained the penis and the testicles, then you tell me, what meaning do the testicles and the penis have? Is that genitalia the male genitalia or is the genitalia the female genitalia? Because you cannot say, nah, the rest of your body is feminine, but that part is masculine. You can't say that. You can't say that. Because this person has actually decided that uh, I am all feminine right now. And it is not your business. It is not your business to go and tell them that, nah, money, nah, money. I understand that you want to present yourself as a woman. Yeah, but that part of your body is for male, nah? No. No, I'm completely male for, for, for a woman. Who are you to question my identity? So you realize that what the trans person does through practice, yes, what the trans person does through lived experience is that they completely destabilize the gendered meaning of the penis or the gendered meaning of the vagina. If you do a Google search, you are going to find that there are more and more trans men who are giving birth. Trans men giving birth. What does it mean, trans men giving birth? It basically means that there are trans men who have undergone, uh, you know, some kinds of gender, uh, you know, gender conformist uh, surgery, um, um, gender conformist surgery. So therefore, they have undergone breast reduction. They have taken testosterone injections. They are beginning to have facial hair, but they have retained the ovaries. They have retained the, the uterus. So, a trans man can look like me and can conceive and can give birth. So, it is going to become more and more common for a child to say, my father gave birth to me. And that is not going to be a grammatically incorrect sentence. It's going to be an absolutely grammatically correct sentence. My father gave birth to me. Why not? So what we are really looking at, therefore, is um, the vagina, therefore, is being resignified. The vagina is, in that case, becoming a male organ because it belongs to my father. Right? So therefore, just as this hand, does not have any kind of, you know, gender assigned to it. Yeah, it doesn't have a gender assigned to it. It can be a male hand, it can be a female hand. Um, actually, very often, you know, when I was, my hands are, look, you know, they look like this right now, but but all my life, all my life, um, <clears throat> uh, in school definitely, but sometimes in colleges as well, um, other men, uh, other boys would take my hand and this is oh you know they would say oh you have got such long fingers they would say oh you've got such long fingers mm. uh, so what they're actually trying to say is that my hand is feminine but they are kind of uh, they're stumbling on that word so they are going to come up with something that is euphemistic so they're going to say your hands are so artistic they can't say feminine, so they are going to say artistic. But then there are going to be others who, the moment they shake hands, they're going to say, "Oh, your hands are so soft, like a woman's hands." Good. So then, basically, basically, the rest of me is male, but my hands are female. Nice, no? Nice. So the rest of me is female, a uh, male, hands female. Can you say that? <laughs> you can't, right? 
Um, so therefore, uh, I hope that after today's discussion, none of us are going to, you know, uh, mouth uh, blindly the, the second wave feminist mantra, sex is biological, gender is social, because I think by now it has been sufficiently proven that sex is not biological. Sex is as social as gender. And if gender is just a collection of stories, sex is also a collection of stories. It's a myth. So myths exist as stories. Myths do not have any kind of empirical, tangible, physical reality. So sex and gender are as real as Batman, as real as Wonder Woman. So what queer theory does then is that queer theory basically says, okay, so let us use this. Let us use this instability of meaning. And let us therefore try and see if playing with language can become a politics in itself. Absolutely. That is what queer theory does. It plays with language. It plays with language in the sense that you know, I, I, for example, have had to face this question many, many times. It is almost 4.40, it's 4.43 now. I'll speak for another two minutes, after which I shall take questions, and later on, of course, we can continue. Um, but, um, but many, many times I've been asked this question. You know, people have come up to me and said, oh, sir, but, uh, but you know, um, I once met a, a, a lesbian couple, um, or I met a gay couple. Uh, and and then you know uh, these two women, sir, you know they are introducing each other as as husband and wife, sir. If they're introducing each other as husband and wife, are they not uh, conforming, uh, you know, to a certain heteronormative uh, structure? Are they not therefore paying tribute to uh, to heterosexuality, which is where you have the existence of husband and wife? I have heard this question so often. So before you ask me that question, I'm answering it. No. No, they are not. When they are calling themselves husband and wife, a part of them is perhaps conforming to the heteronormative definition of wife, right? But then there is this other part that is completely destroying the definition of the husband because according to patriarchy, a husband should have a penis. But she has just claimed the name husband for herself, or her partner has just called her a husband, but the husband doesn't have a penis. So if you are calling a body a husband, and if that body does not have a penis, remember that merely by calling that person a husband, you are destabilizing the meaning of husband. That is query. If you are calling a man wife, you are therefore severing, you are cutting the totally artificial arbitrary relationship that is there between the signifier and the signified, between the female body and the name wife. You are cutting it. You are saying no, you can have a, a, a penis and you can still claim the word wife for yourself. So therefore, words are becoming floating signifiers, right? So therefore, if a word becomes a floating signifier, then the word is not tied to any specific signified. The wife is not tied to a female body. The husband, uh, the word husband is not tied to a male body. So it is the language that is being mobilized and it is through this mobilization of language that we really have queer theory coming into its own. How do we read queer theory? How do we, not read, but how do we interpret texts using queer theory? Well, this is what we do. We take a text that is supposedly heteronormative we take a text that is supposedly uh, full of heterosexual characters, but we go deep into the meaning of these texts by, uh, by looking at the language that is used. And then once we have looked at the language, we will find that there is a confusion there. 
there is a confusion there. And uh, a classic uh, example of that would be, um, say for example, you were reading a text in which the man is described as being strong and silent, which is a, a very common patriarchal way uh, of looking at masculinity, right? He's strong and silent. He doesn't talk much. Niladri, you're a little feminine because you talk too much. Um, you're a little feminine because you laugh too much. Men don't laugh. Men are very serious. And, and then, um, you know, once you read this, this description of the man being strong and silent, and then you say, oh, but isn't that interesting that, uh, that you know, uh, if you're talking about strength as a male attribute, then when you talk about Nari Shakti, when you talk about Durga, when you talk about Kali, these are supposedly strong women. Do then do they then lose their femininity? Is Durga therefore a trans woman? Is she basically a man underneath? Um, as far as silence is concerned, patriarchy has always wanted women to be silent. So if silence is an attribute of femininity, then is the silent man a woman? See, the moment you start to use these adjectives to describe masculinity or femininity, the whole patriarchal game is exposed as a sham. And that is what queer theory does, is that it is opposed not to, you know, a gender binary in itself. It is opposed not just to sexual binary in itself. It is opposed to all kinds of normativity. It is opposed to all kinds of um, stereotypes. Yes, because we are completely enmeshed in, in a hundred normativities. What queer theory does is that it tries to call out as many of these normativities as possible. So when we are going to practice queer theory, we are going to be aware of how binaries function. This, of course, is a classic deconstructivist, post-structuralist way of interpreting a text. We first identify a binary, and having identified a binary, we then uh, begin to understand that this binary is fake. This binary is unsustainable. And once we have managed to do that, then we, the moment we have exposed the binary as being basically illogical and, and unsustainable, well, that is where queer theory wins. And that is when you become um, queer as a scholar hmm? because you are activating queer politics. And as and when you activate your polit queer politics, whether it be on paper or whether it be in day-to-day -day life, irrespective of your gender, irrespective of your sexual orientation, you become queer. Thank you. And I will take questions now. Thank you, sir, for such an excellent lecture. I am really sorry I cannot make this camera happen today due to some technical difficulties no no that's absolutely fine okay, that's okay fine. sir so we have a couple of questions in the chat box so, yes please uh, 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 rajot s mondal he has posted an interesting question does queer theory mobilize adjectives into verbs um uh, wait hang on a second actually since since you are the one who's reading out the questions i'm yes. not going to open the chat box I'm, okay. I'm not going to open the chat but you can read out the questions okay. and does queer, does queer uh, uh, sorry what is the question yes does queer theory mobilize adjectives into verbs ah um no not um not necessarily i i think the adjectives remain adjectives so therefore you know beautiful remains beautiful pretty remains pretty handsome remains handsome uh, they, it does not become like, you know, um, it's, it's not like, um, you know, he's handsome-ing or, uh, or, or she's pretty-ing. So, so, no, 
the, the adjective does not become a verb, what, what happens is that um, very much a noun becomes a verb. Not so much an adjective, but the noun becomes a verb. So therefore, it becomes, you know, it's, it's more a case of, you know, are you woman in or are you man in? Are you boying or are you girling? So therefore, what is really happening then is that being a boy or being a girl does not become a noun. It becomes an act, right? So therefore, the noun becomes a verb. It becomes an act. So therefore, you cannot say. Um, so this is Judith Butler's, uh, you know, theory of performativity. Uh, is in the sense that gender is not something that you are. Gender is something that you do. It is an act. Now, it is another matter that when we do gender, very often our performance of gender is in conformity with what patriarchy demands of us. And that is generous performity, performative. However, there is the performance of gender, which is volitional, which is I perform the gender that I want to, even if it is, even if it goes against patriarchy. So therefore, um, so no, it's not a question of adjectives becoming verbs. It mo it's more a question of nouns becoming verbs. Thank you. Next thank, question. Thank you, sir. I have two questions. Uh, so my first question is, what is the importance of identity in queer politics? And the second one is, how should we perceive intersection of feminist theory and queer politics? Yeah, well, um, the, just to answer your second question first, queer theory, it, it's not a question of intersection. Queer theory is feminist. Queer theory is very, very feminist. And for, had there not been feminism, queer theory simply wouldn't have developed. Um, so therefore, queer theory is intrinsically feminist because it is opposed to patriarchy in the same way that feminism is opposed to patriarchy. However, however, I am very, very saddened. I am very saddened by something that is happening in the West. I'm not terribly sure about other countries, but I'm appalled what is happening in England right now, um, where you have this astonishing, and this is something which is also fueled by the right-wing press. Um, so, so newspapers such as Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph, the Times, um, the right-wing newspapers are very much adding fuel to this fire, which is that they are, they are making it into a battle between, you know, women who are gender assigned male at birth, I'm sorry, female at birth, and women who are gender assigned male at birth. So now it has become an actual fight between, um, you know, bio women and trans women. So, so now an entirely artificial fight is being induced into um, the uh, queer uh, community and which is making me very, very sad because I read uh, a couple of days ago that, um, you know, in England there are some lesbians who are saying get the L out. So they are saying that we do not wish to be a part of the queer movement anymore um, because we are feeling attacked by trans women. This is preposterous. Nobody is attacking anybody. Trans women simply want to live the way they wish to live. They are not a threat to bio women. But there are some bio women feminists and of course there is a name for them, right? So they are called TERF. T-E-R-F. They're called trans-exclusionary radical feminists. Very sad. So therefore, I think that queer theory and feminism have got a lot of common ground. Um, queer theory, I think, is, is absolutely a part of third-wave feminism. Absolutely. No questions asked. It has definitely uh, deviated from second-wave feminism, and I explained why. It's because second-wave feminism still believe that sex is biological, gender is social. Queer theory says no. Absolutely not. The sex is equally social. Uh, and as far as the, your first question is concerned, what is how, how important is identity to queer theory? Extremely important. But what we really have to understand, that, the, that what queer theory consistently says, is that identity is changeable. Identity is changeable. We are changing all the time. So therefore, you know, identity is, identities are not fixed. 
identities are not fixed. So the moment we start to acknowledge that everybody is is potentially, um, you know, malleable, changeable. Uh, the the adjective that I'm looking for it's just come to me now is protean, right? Protean. So therefore, identity is protean. It is changeable. Um, so initially, in the first wave, second wave, we were still sticking to the idea that there is a sort of a stable identity that is unchanging. Once a man, always a man. Once a woman, always a woman. Well, that has completely changed. So therefore, what queer theory does is to say that identity is constructed through language. Language does not have a stability. Therefore, identity doesn't have a stability either. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. So let me just move into the third question posted by Dr. Dishari Roy. <clears throat> How has the rights of sexual minorities in India been affected with scraping of Section 377? Mm. Well, first of all, Section <laughs> first of all, Section 377 has not been scrapped. This is this is such a misguided notion that people still have. Section 377 has not been scrapped. It has been read down. The verb is read down. The act is reading down. So what has actually happened is that Section 377 is very much, very much present in the Indian Penal Code. What does reading down do? To read down a section or to read down an article is to limit its applicability. So what this means is that Section 377 will, after September 2018, 6th of September 2018, it will only be applied, it will still be applied, but it will only be applied to those acts of sexual intercourse in which one is a minor or in which it is taking place in a public place, public place, or if there is a lack of consent. So if these three things happen, and if any one of these three things happen in, in the act of a sexual intercourse, then you can absolutely apply, apply Section 377 to it. Otherwise not. So, so Section 377, uh, you know, this is something that never comes up in day-to-day um, in -day news, but, uh, but it is still being applied across India. Section 377 is still being applied, but it is being applied in cases where, for example, you know, a, a boy has been sodomized um, or, or a young girl has been sodomized um, or, um, or, or somebody has been sodomized um, without their consent, right? So that's what it is. Um, so, so therefore, um, Section 377, the fact that it is being read down is, of course, psychologically very important. Uh, for uh, for the um, LGBT persons in India. It is psychologically important because before, even when two men or two women were having sex, even in private, even in private, uh, with full consent, and even when both of them were adults, in the eyes of the law, they were still committing a crime. But at least that has stopped. So, so a huge kind of... Um, um, Fear has been lifted, definitely. Uh, has the ground reality changed? In the sense that, yes, there, there is greater discussion uh, of, of sexual minority issues, which didn't happen before. More and more people are coming out um, as gay or lesbian uh, and, um, or, or as trans. So therefore, there is an openness uh, in, on, on the level of discussion that has happened. Um, some universities and colleges have also set up, um, you know, LGBT support groups, student organizations. That has also begun happening. So yes, so certain changes have happened. However, you know, um, it is it is very localized, right? So therefore, chances are that it tends to happen more in urban centers rather than in in rural or semi-urban or suburban institutions. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's I mean the changes are patchy, but it's beginning to happen. Thank you. Okay, sir. Uh, we have another question posted by one of our PhD student, Laboni. Mm. So she has mm. asked why 
can why do we see uh, a control over women's voice women's movement or sexual domination uh, well you see laboni what you really have to understand is that there is control over men too i i think that you know this is something that we really actually do not acknowledge is that we we think that patriarchy is only oppressive to women yes in certain contexts it's it may look as though it is oppressive only to women but if you if you actually look at it men till very recently didn't have complete sexual freedom either and men men still don't um so therefore but you're absolutely right that there tends to be more Uh, of of restrictions on women and that is simply because um women are regarded by patriarchy not as human beings women are regarded in patriarchy as um as uh, as property as property women are not allowed to have full humanity women are regarded as reproductive machines so therefore no matter how liberated you are no matter how qualified you are no matter how many degrees you have invariably you know you are still going to regard your wife as as a reproductive machine right so you demand that the wife produce a, a male child you demand that the wife does not produce a female child you demand that the wife produces a male child as soon as possible so therefore um and so therefore you know you you can publicly talk about queerness and you can talk about lgbt rights and you can do all of that publicly but in private you could be beating up your wife because you know uh, you have found out that the child is going to be female and you don't want a female child right because you ultimately regard your wife as a reproductive machine and you want her to produce a certain kind of product and if you find that she is not producing that kind of product then you kick the machine so the simple answer to your question is that there are these greater vigilances on women's sexuality because patriarchy refuses to allow women to make sexual choices for themselves actually to women to make any choices regarding themselves because when you are making a choice you are basically acting like a human being and patriarchy will not allow you to do that so that's the problem thank you for a very important question thank you sir for uh, for attending all those our questions so carefully but i have one question left sorry there is no oh. other question left in the chat box but i personally no, have another question that's that's absolutely fine okay. i also okay. have one observation and also i want to share something after momita's okay. Right. Okay. Right, right, right 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 okay okay so well, just, as, just hold on a second as, i'll as hold on a second i'll be i'll be back i'll, I'll okay. be back just hold on a second i'll be okay. back Yes. Okay, yeah. Sir. So we can have the questions here. Yeah. Yes. So my question is that, as you have rightly pointed out, the movement of trans exclusionary radical feminist movement, as opposed mm-hmm. to that, we have recently seen trans feminism or radical trans feminism as another movement which is uh, coming up. They mm-hmm. uh, they say themselves to be intersectional feminist or apply intersectional feminist approach mm. in that mm. sense can you please throw some light on the intersectional aspect of these kind of politics as opposed mm. to the identity politics that has been forced in those grounds for a long period of time thank mm. you sir yeah yeah very very important question i did not talk about intersectional feminism at all um but let us understand that when intersectional feminism uh, was inaugurated um you know by kimberly crenshaw um so when she is doing this mind you every time i talk about intersectional feminism i invariably uh, talk about a document uh, this is unfortunately not very well known but everywhere i go i talk about this document called 
the Kumbahi River Collective. Yeah, so you may want to take that down. The Kumbahi River Collective, C O M B A H W E, Kumbahi River Collective. Remember that the Kumbahi River Collective is coming out sometime in the 1970s and 1973 or 4, um, um, you know, uh, but you can Google it and you'll find it. 70s. In, in, that, uh, in that document, remember, in the 1970s, women are already saying that our feminism is not going to be effective as long as we uh, do not involve men in it, right? So therefore, when we talk about intersectional feminism today, we are basically talking about creating a movement in which gender is not the only axis along which we function, we take into account other axes as well, such as race, class, caste, religion, nationality, and also gender in the sense that our feminism must include men too. It, it must include men too. So therefore, if it includes men, if it includes trans men, if it includes trans women, if it includes people from all races, uh, or all categories, all classes, only then will that feminism be a properly feminism. So there are a lot of people, including one of my students, um, who, who had once posted on her status update, you know, um, intersectional feminism or bust. You know, so basically you're either an intersectional feminist or you're not a feminist at all. And I would sort of agree with her. I would agree with her because if you're not being an intersectional feminist, then you're not being a feminist at all. You cannot say, for example, that, oh, you know, uh, I'm a feminist. I'm very interested in gender issues. But, uh, but Niladri, don't talk to me about Dalit problems and all of that because that is a caste problem. I don't want to worry about caste problem. I'm worried about gender problem. You can't afford to do that. If you're a feminist, you will have to consider caste problems. You will have to consider you know, race problems and everything. So intersectional feminism is basically the much, much more inclusive feminism. That's what it is, in which, of course, trans persons are also included. So that's what it is. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. That has okay. sufficiently given me a clarity, but there is yeah. another question posted in the chat sure. box. Sure. Uh, yes. sure. Could you please explain about pan, I think pansexuality, demisexuality hmm. and a gender? A gender, yes. Um, so these are terms. Uh, these are terms that, of course, you know, you don't need me to explain these. These are uh, pansexuality. Yeah, yeah. So these are terms that you, uh, you you can easily Google them. You know, there is a there is a continuously uh, you know expanding um, you know a glossary of, of these terms. So you don't need me to tell you what they are. These you can look up on Google as well. But just because since you asked me this question, pansexual is basically. Uh, that person who is attracted to all kinds of persons, right? All kinds of persons. So basically it means that if I identify as gay, then I am only going to identify with, um, say, biological, uh, you know, bio men. If I'm calling myself gay. If I'm calling myself lesbian, then I'm only going to be attracted to bio women. But, uh, but then... If I say that, no, you know, I'm attracted to bio men and bio women, then bisexual. But if I say, no, I'm attracted to bio men, trans men, bio women, trans women, trans persons, that is when I basically become pansexual, which is basically to say that my sexual attraction is not exclusively oriented towards uh, any one particular gender. Right, so it, it it is so malleable and it is so fluid that it can be attracted to anybody. That is as far as pansexuality is concerned. A gender, somebody who simply does not, um, you know, conform to any kind of gender stereotype at all. Um, you know, 
so um, so I know I know a couple of people who identify as a gender, uh, and uh, for them, remember, shopping for them is a, is an absolute nightmare because. <laughs> Because you know, you know the clothes stores. You've all been, many of you have been doing puja shopping, so you know, sort of men section, women section, and they find it very difficult to do, to to shop for clothes. Um, and I think that there are some very few designers that have come up with gender neutral clothing. Not enough. I think there should be more people who should do gender neutral clothing. I, for one, would be very happy. I would happily wear gender neutral clothes if they become available. Um, so, a gender is somebody who do not wish to identify uh, as anybody in the gender spectrum uh, uh, who is basically saying that uh, you know nothing nothing of that is going to uh, i don't conform to any of those uh, i don't fit into any of those boxes yeah did did i miss anything uh, sir we have addressed all the questions that are there in the chat box dr troisinha could you please uh, give your yeah. insight yeah, I, I think Troy probably has a, a question uh, and a, or an observation. It's, it's yeah. not a question, uh, it's rather an to sum up what you have uh, delivered today. Shall we say that uh, from gender binary, to we are proceeding towards gender diversities, and Absolutely. that is something that is a Absolutely. way out uh, to yes. talk about uh, the way because yes. uh, often we see that how people are uh, harassed, uh, the quote unquote, mm. the identities, if we are talking about the identities. Right. the harassment of the identities and all that mm. so mm. if we want to come out with a kind of solution then i think that from binary it's it's more i mean it's it's accepted mm. that if we mm. proceed towards diversity absolutely uh, yes yes absolutely. I, I just want oh, to throw it throw it you know i i am um, i am beginning to lose patience you know now with people who come up to me very well meaning oh. people no offense and they come up to me from all kinds of educational institutions and they are going to say, um, sir, we are having a gender sensitization program. Could you please come and talk to us? And I'm extremely tired of gender sensitization programs because what happens, what happens at gender sensitization program is that their expectation is for me to go and say, please respect women. You know, women are our mothers and women are our sisters and all of that nonsense. Um, and I say no. I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk about gender uh, sensitization. I'll talk about gender diversity sensitization. That is what you need to be a little bit more careful about. And and a lot of people have difficulty. A lot of people have difficulty. They there are people who are like oh, but hey, but oh, mane oh, nari shikhar bapare kichu bolon sa sa. Don't call me. Don't call me for that. Absolutely. There are other people who can do that. <laughs> Absolutely. That is true. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there some comments which are still coming in because yes, they are sort yes, of flashing sir. up yes. and um, there is one comment posted by Boishali, our master student. She is saying yes. there are so many pronouns where call themselves. For child who came from that background, their con concept and concepts are fully chaos. Is that okay or positive? Ah, wow. I, I don't quite, could you, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether the question is clear to me or not. What is she basically asking? Is it possible for her to unmute herself and ask me that question uh, yes, directly? Definitely. Boishali, are you there? Boishali? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, so you could just ask me directly, that would be, I would find it easier to understand. Yeah. Sir, I'm Boishali. ফল আছে 
একটা হচ্ছে আপেল আর আরেকটা হচ্ছে কমলা লেবু তারপরে তো যখন আমরা ন্যাশপাতি দেখতাম তখন আমাদের ভীষণ কনফিউজ হয়ে যেতাম যে এ কি মানে এটা তো আপেলও নয় কমলা লেবুও নয় এটি কি এটা এটি কি কেমন এটা আপেলের মানে শেপটা তো একই লাগছে কিন্তু আপেলের মতন লালও নয় কমলা লেবুর মতন কমলাও নয় এটা কি কনফিউশনের কোনো দরকার নেই আমাদের যেটা একেবারে ছোট থেকে বাচ্চাদের বোঝাতে হবে সেটা হচ্ছে যে জেন্ডার দু রকমের হয় না অত সহজ মানে অত ডিফিকাল্ট তো নয় রং যেমন দু রকমের হয় না মানুষ যেমন দু রকমের হয় না মানে কেউ কেউ একটু রাগি কেউ একটু কম রাগি কেউ একবারে রাগি নয় মানুষের চরিত্র যেমন দু রকমের হয় না মানুষের জেন্ডার আইডেন্টিটি বা সেক্সুয়াল আইডেন্টিটিও দু রকমের হয় না ফলে তুমি যখন বড় হচ্ছ তুমি দেখবে যে কিছু কিছু লোক আছে যারা বলবে যে হ্যাঁ আমাকে হি বলে ডাকতে পারো তাতে কোনো অসুবিধা নেই কেউ কেউ আছে বলবে যে আমাকে সি বলে ডাকতে পারো আমার কোনো অসুবিধা নেই আছে অসুবিধা নেই আবার কেউ কেউ বলবে যে আমাকে আমি হি বা শিতে আমি আমি স্বাচ্ছন্দ্য বোধ করি না আমাকে দে বলো ঠিক আছে ফলে আমাদের আস্তে আস্তে এমন একটা জায়গায় পৌঁছিতে হবে যেখানে আমাদের এই বৈচিত্রটা আমাদের কাছে স্বাভাবিক মনে হবে যে কেউ বলে আমাকে দে বলা হোক কেউ বলে আমাকে হি বলা হোক কেউ বলে আমাকে সি বলা হোক অসুবিধা কিছু নেই তাহলে যেমন বাজারেতে আপেল পাওয়া যাচ্ছে কমলা লেবু পাওয়া যাচ্ছে ন্যাশপাতিও পাওয়া যাচ্ছে তেমন সেখানে হি সি দে তিনটেই থাকুক Thank you, sir, uh, for uh, clarifying this interesting question. And mm. I think that has actually uh, summarized our discussion for today's uh, class slash uh, lecture. So thank you, Professor Niladri Chatterjee for this exciting and enlightening lecture for students and also for us researchers and faculty members. I would like to thank Professor Dr. Shoma Bandapadhyay, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Diamond Harbor Women's University. I would like to thank Professor Dr. Shoidu Rahman, Respected Registrar of Diamond Harbor Women's University, Respected Dean of Arts and all our faculty members for organizing this excellent event and I think our students have greatly benefited by your talk, sir. Hope we like to see you again as soon as possible. And next time, uh, I, I hope, oh, sir, sir has left the meeting. So we hope that next time we will invite uh, Professor Chatterjee offline. So with that expectation, thank you so much. Thank you all.